much and I want first to congratulate the, the graduates for, 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 for working hard and, um, and achieving a great milestone. Some of us started regulatory affairs and we never had any training. I th actually we've been practicing RA without formal, formal training. Uh, it's just by practicing and reading yourself and, and learning uh, through experience. But actually the formal training in terms of introduction to RA, like the way you people have had, is something that uh, we, we, we hope we had that opportunity. Um, and I want to say congratulations. For the APN team, thank you also. I think you're doing a great job, uh, not only for this country, but for Africa, because I think um, the vision that you have is a good vision. Uh, it's, a, it's a vision that um, I think most of our academic institutions don't have uh, currently. Uh, unfortunately, the pharmacist who is graduating today is geared towards hospital pharmacy. Um, and, and the focus is to push them towards hospital pharmacy. And we can, agree, we can say it's a big space also. Clinical pharmacy is a good area, but I think there is a little emphasis on RA, which is a good gap that you're trying to fill in terms of uh, a workforce development. And, and I really appreciate your, uh, your vision. I think it's a good one, uh, which is going to really strengthen the, the regulatory space. Unfortunately, and maybe David, you can bear witness with me here. Unfortunately, the farmers, the pharmacist who is working in in, in the RA space, they work as a conduit, uh, as a conveyor belt. Uh, the, the dosier is made in in Europe, and or somewhere, and there is just to deliver it at PPB or to go into the portal of PPB and put it there. So people rarely read and give scientific advice to the parties they work, to, to, to they work for. So I think I want to encourage you as you learn, try and also practice what you've done. Because I think majority of our RA professionals, the ones who are we call old RA professionals, they're actually conveyor belt. They get a dosier from a company, they take exactly the same junk to PPB without even reading and trying to even rearrange to the format of PPB. So please um, practice and read the guidelines and, and, and try and, um, and, 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 and uh, add value to, to wherever you're going to get an opportunity to work. I think when I was being invited here, I was to speak about maturity level three and its impact to the industry. Um, so just to give you a historical perspective about this maturity level issue, um, the issue was because globally, the, traditionally there has been uh, a classification of regulatory authorities in terms of stringent regulatory authorities and uh, uh, I think unclassified regulatory authorities. Uh, in India they call them rest of the world. Uh, it's rest of the world, ROW. It's called ROW in India. So. The stringent regulatory authority has been traditionally in Europe, US, Japan. So when WHO was being asked, because that was the basis at which exemptions were being granted, and when it reached, it reached a level where now, because WHO is a member state country, a uh, member state organization, during one World Health Organization frog, uh, assembly, usually it's done every year. Members, member countries go to Geneva and they question the policies of WHO. So the question was, how did you determine a regulatory authority is stringent? So there was no framework that was used to determine whether US FDA is actually stringent. So and that's how WHO benchmarking came in. So WHO now started, developed a tool uh, that is used to benchmark regulatory authorities and be able to ascertain that they are at a particular level. So I was involved with the initial part, I think, when we were piloting the initial phase, it was actually five levels. There are still, there are actually six levels, but now there were six initially, five levels, 
but again they realized uh, after piloting the initial phase, I think it was reduced now to four levels, with the fifth level being WHO listed authority. There is no longer the word stringent regulatory authority. It's called WHO listed authority. Once you reach maturity level four, you, un you, you undergo a formal assessment to be listed officially. Currently in the world, I think there are two which are listed uh, officially. Uh, it's uh, Korea and, uh, and Singapore. Um, so they are in four levels. Uh, basically, there are about 268 indicators, sub-indicators that are monitored. And there are eight regulatory functions that are co-regulatory functions that are monitored in addition to the ninth one, which, which is usually lot, re, lot release when it comes to countries that are manufacturing vaccines. But if you are not manufacturing vaccines and you're just looking at medicines uh, and, and vaccines importation, there are actually um, eight regulatory functions that are, that are monitored. And in, all, on, in one is regulatory system, which is the overall overarching uh, system that the institution must have. So, and then there are the technical areas, which is marketing authorization, which is registration, uh, vigilance, market control, inspectorate, licensing. There are, there are several. There are actually eight. Um, so, for us as, as a country, and I think there is a lot of discussion about PPB being in maturity level three, um, what does it mean? So, it means a lot. Um, First, if I may speak in terms of PPB as an organization, is that it will force us, PPB, to be actually independent. Uh, and I say this because PPB is not fully independent uh, as, as, an, as an agency. PPB, if you look at the history of PPB, um, and Benjamin talked briefly about uh, uh, the issue of VET, and maybe I'll give you also the historical perspective of it. Uh, PPB as an agency started from an office in Afia House. They used to be a chief pharmacist. That chief pharmacist used to be um, in Afia House and had several pharmacists. And it started as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, as a branch of pharmaceutical services where they realized that the country was buying medicines, but they don't know where it's coming from. They, so they started a small registration system, and I think I'll, I, if you have time, I will give you history of PPB. There's a, there's a slide I'd made. So, and if you look at PPB, initially started as just a, 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 a pharmacy practice agency. Actually, if you look at CAP 244, it's actually a practice act. There's nothing to do with products regulation in pharmacy. Uh, it was not there when it was envisioned. It was just a pharmacy practice act where you're looking at licensing of a chemist, license, registration of a pharmacist only. Then in 1980, that's when they saw that the government was buying medicine, but they don't know where it's coming from. So a registration system was started. And it was started without even any law, no regulation. It's they just put kind of um, procurement requirement you have to have a registration system. So they created a small checklist, and it, it, it built up up to 1991. When now, apart from registration, they realized, no, we need to start testing. NQCL was, was brought on board. Piecemeal amendments to the act was being done. Like it's an old cloth you're trying to just patch here and here and here, after you realize there is this gap. Then over time, uh, over time, now other functions started coming in. Even in fact, for, for a fact, I think pharmacovigilance was just included into this act in 2019, 2019 as we speak. It was not even there, even clinical trials. They were not there. We were practicing these things, but they were not even in the main act. They were actually, we we're just using guidelines. So if you, as you look at the development of PPB, we have just been patching off CAP, uh, CAP 244 
to try and react to to the um, industry requirements and uh, that one has had a lot of impact as we patch off cap 244 there are some people who now open their eyes and they see we can't remove this from this side when you as you're focusing on this area now the vets now look at it from another angle <laughs> and that's where benjamin's answer will come in so it started first with toxicology because animal by the way these the issues of animal uh, of, of of pesticides and herbicides were actually at the, uh, in the act so it started with Pest pesticide control board they took the toxicology part in fact the vet they started offering uh, msc in pharmacology even before i think before even university of nairobi started offering because they started offering pharmacology and toxicology in in in, in kabete some of the toxicologists we have actually majority of them studied in kabet then later uh, the appetite increased towards getting the medicines and the medicines how they took it is it's just because of our selfishness as pharmacists we always think that this profession is only for pharmacists only we never want to in to incorporate anyone so when we started discussing having an a uh, veterinary medicine directorate headed by a vet at PPB it was a no it was not even a discussion yeah because if we had done that they would not have taken it if we had allowed three four vets to come and work at the board they would not have taken it but we wanted to have a, a, a veterinary medicine directorate with headed by a pharmacist and all people are pharmacists and that was where we 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 lost the war so they went political uh so that is just to give you the 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 the, the challenge that uh, we are facing but just go back to the discussion about ml3 so over time so we have been ben benchmark by the way in in africa ppp is one of the countries that has been piloted in terms of benchmarking more than any other country we we were first benchmarked in 2009 even before gbt came in and it informed a lot of regulatory system strengthening globally then we were benchmarked uh, in 202 again that was the second time then when gbt was being piloted actually we piloted i think i was part of the igat team which was piloting that that in 2017 and now we uh, when the gbt now was formally put in we were benchmarked in 2022 so WHO is very diplomatic when they get observations they don't call them observations they call them institutional development plans so we call them idps so during that benchmarking we we received a lot of idps um that is the gaps the gaps are many um to be sincere there are almost about 120 gaps that were there of which 50 percent is related with the number of staff at ppb so last year i think uh, dr evans here helped us we were, we were able to hire um 25 staff who came in and they were able, able to help us and we're hoping world bank is going to come in to hire some more pharmacists in, into ppb but that not that's just added helped us a, as a bit and we're still struggling because the numbers is the problem because ppb as an institution requires <clears throat> around 350 at minimum staff let's not say pharmacists staff please i think let's be clear i think we cannot be all pharmacists there uh, it, it has to be a, a majority might be pharmacists but we need like biomedical engineers to help us on medical device sector we need uh, even in this issue of discussion of BE, we need clinicians, medical doctors to help us in that area. So there's a lot of multi, basically multidisciplinary staff to be there, but majority might be pharmacists because of the pharmaceutical components that are there. So we need around 350 of which almost 250 are technical staff. But when they, when they like last year, when Professor Juguna Ndugu when he was reading the budget, he said he has frozen all employment. You know, that statement affects PPB. That policy's decision affects PPB from recruiting. 
So you, you know when he says it in, in, in parliament, you think ah, it doesn't affect, but it means every institution. So the bureaucracy of hiring staff at PPB is just a nightmare based on those policy pronouncements at Treasurer. And what Vimal was saying, what Treasury says is totally what, what is required on this side. So even when now, let's say, for example, you know we are pharmacists, look in our forest of pharmacy. But when government now wants to do development, they look at it from a global, countrywide perspective. So when they are doing resource allocation, they look at which area is important. So they look at it from a global, and they say, oh, infrastructure is, more, is better than even health. So you'll find that they will not put more resources to health. And when you talk about health again, the discussion on health is about service delivery. Not, you know, regulatory science is actually, you cannot know it's, 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 it doesn't have direct impact on patient. It's an indirect impact. So many policy makers cannot be able to see the value of PPB unless, let's say, for example, products become poor quality. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, substandard medicines in the market. That's when now they see the value of regulation into the system. And, 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 and sometimes when we are in these forums of PSK, when PPB recalls our products, you find people complaining. But that one shows that the regulator is working when there is a recall. It should not be that, that the regulator has not been working. Actually, a recall is good for the industry because it helps to strengthen the quality of. So we, we've been having a lot of things that, have, that are coming out that are affecting local manufacturers. For example, if I may say recalls that are, that are being done in the country, 50% are actually from locally produced medicines. 50% of all our recalls. If I look, I'm, 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 because I'm doing a PhD, there's a paper I'm publishing, actually it's now undergoing peer review. Uh, and it's going to come out maybe by August, uh, by, by November, there it should be able to, to come out. That paper, I was looking at the market complaints, complaints that people sent to PPB, this product is not working, this product uh, is molding, this product is doing this. So I was looking at that. And, and, and we see that majority of market complaints are actually from local manufacturers, again. So you see that as PPB is strengthening its system, local manufacturing are being impacted. Uh, negatively in terms of as the standards go high, local manufacturers technically have a challenge in complying to the requirements, which is not bad. I think it is a good thing because now it forces the local manufacturers to invest more on the people. And you, when I go to local manufacturers to inspect them, we see that majority of the problems that local manufacturers are facing are more of lack of human resource capacity just even just making SOPs only, even just SOPs, standard pro uh, operating procedures is a challenge. So that is one of the impact of, of uh, GBT assessment um, that, uh, that, that we are now feeling. Uh, this issue of B, because when we were being benchmarked, we, we had exempted local manufacturers from B. And the GBT requires that when you have a guideline, it should be cut across all, all stakeholders. So you should not have a criteria different for foreigners and a criteria different for your local people. It has to be the same. So it was an, a gap that we are, we are actually putting different standards for local, which is not the same as the one for products that are coming from India. So, and that's how the story of bioequivalence came in. Everybody must have the same standard. So the more we, 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 we are assessed, the more these gaps appear and affect the, the industry. But the positive side, as I've said, where Dr. Sagwa talked about, will talk maybe about it, is that it is helping us to hire more staff. Because now the gap is more apparent to the government, because we tell them we can't achieve maturity level three, because the report is there, the numbers are fewer. 
vis-à-vis -vis the applications we receive. So it gives us an opportunity, even when uh, the president now understands and even the ministry understands the importance of GBT, something that we've been struggling to explain to them at, at, at policy level. Everybody nowadays, even when we go to parliament to ask to answer questions, when they hear anything, if you want to escape anything, you just tell them it is a requirement of GBT. <laughs> they understand that it is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is very important because they know that with maturity level three, it will allow our industry to be able to export products outside Kenya. It will allow our, 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 our system to be recognized outside Kenya. In Africa, there is a, a, the normal triangle of how development has been, has been in Africa generally. There is the West Africa, there is this Kenya here, and the South Africa. In the Sub-Saharan Africa, generally, that triangle is the one that pushes development around. There is the West Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana. In, in East Africa, it is us, maybe with... Uh, but it's just us. I think Ethiopia is not, uh, even Tanzania is not, but it's just us, then South Africa down in the south. So looking at that, the even Tanzania has maturity level three, but it doesn't have an impact in the region. So strategically, because we are the ones who have more manufacturers. So it is a global push to have PPB be in maturity level three because we control the, the industry. And uh, when we control the industry, it means that opportunities for you young professionals will be huge. Um, AMA is coming, uh, the African Medicine Agency is coming, and that agency itself, the staffing is still very, I don't know how where they'll get the staff. It's still a problem. So it's an opportunity for you people to look at. For PPB, I think for us, we are looking at this, like the other day, the one, by the way, Evans, one of our staff that you hired has just resigned because he's been poached. Because the training, the training that you get and this training that you have, it's because it's creating and giving opportunities to people to go to other areas, which is good for our country. So the number of staff, the industry upscaling, the opportunities of of of, uh, of 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 interacting with people outside the, uh, this this region are uh, huge. Um, and lastly, uh, just to to finalise my talk in terms of the impact of of, of this in academia, just to uh, to just go uh, to academia part. I think this GBT is helping us because. First, there's this master's course in UN, it's called APVGIL AP, AP and Pharmacovigilance. Um, that course actually started because PPB saw a gap in pharmacovigilance. And actually we worked with the University of Nairobi to develop that course. Uh, personally, there are some things that I feel needs to be worked on in academia, which, which, we, which is a very controversial. Calling courses MFARM sometimes is not good because it restricts it to pharmacists only. And, 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 and it makes it not, not to attract people because there are people who are not pharmacists but they can easily push your agenda. I was, I was in a meeting where we were discussing about gender, gender issues. I did not know that even when we have 10, 10, 10 women together, they might be actually gender insensitive than having men. Because sometimes people think that when you have only ladies, they will be more gender sensitive than, than let's say when you have a mix. So sometimes when you just stay alone as professionals, you might actually be not thinking broadly. You're just in your own forest, opening up these courses to even people, even APN I think is a challenge. Don't restrict it to pharmacists only. There are people who are working in medical device industry who are not pharmacists, mm -hmm. and, and they can actually help to drive the agenda better. Mm -hmm. uh, so this GBT is helping us now to strengthen areas that were conventionally thought to be pharmacist area. I'm not saying that it's not a pharmacist area, but 
it's helping us to see opportunities. For example, medical device industry is a, is a good area. I, my friend uh, is talking about cosmetic area. I think is a very nice area. Food supplement is a good area, which means that nutritionists must come on board. Uh, you cannot leave them out. Um, uh, cosmetologists must come on board. Uh, there is an area of herbal medicines, which is actually nascent. Ayurvedic medicines, but, but now it's herbal medicines. So, so those areas, GBT, as we do GBT for medicines and vaccines, we are also looking at it across, vertically, across PPB, across all functions. So if you look at now, we are working on our new strategic plan. We are looking at even benchmarking with the principles for medicines. We are benchmarking our medical device sections, our cosmetic device sections, our food supplement sections, all of them are being now benchmarked using the same standard to make, to make it grow. Because it's an area that has been neglected. Even pharmacists, when you tell them to, to, to manage cosmetics at PPB, they feel like it is not my area. So it is something that now people are now seeing that's an area to, 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 be, to be strengthened. Um, uh, for those who are in the industry, I think what we want is you people to, to really support the regulatory system at PPB. It is still a very young regulatory system, but I believe, because I've, 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 been, I've been doing regulatory system strengthening uh, in the region, uh, generally in Africa, and I've managed to go somewhere outside, even in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia, I've gone to many countries to, to support their regulatory system. Generally, the, uh, the way I know, the PPB's regulatory system is good. I can tell you it's very good, uh, based on my small experience with seeing countries in terms of their regulatory system, especially when it comes to uh, registration system. It's still a bit having issues, uh, but those issues are being strengthened because people don't understand how it works. So I, I would encourage that you support the system. If there is any area that you think is not um, good, highlight it because I think we have a lot of stakeholder meetings so that we can be able to, to improve it. But generally speaking, I want to encourage you to support the system. Try and practice whatever you've learned um, and try and implement. What I've seen from my small experience of regulatory system strengthening is that people avoid the hard areas. The hard areas in pharmacy is the API, API part, basically pharmaceutics part. People don't like it. Formulation science, pharmaceutics, and analytics, and, and analysis. That area is the area that can stabilize you in array. Pharmaceutical analysis, pharmaceutical sciences, pharmaceutics, special formulation science, and 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 um, and, and areas uh, that in terms of synthesis of API chemistry, that area is an area that you should take interest. It's an area that is very small, it's, it's very nascent, but there's an areas that that are not really resourced. I know there is a wave of people wanting to go to pharmacovigilance, all of us. <laughs> there is that wave of pharmacovigilance. That wave is going to be full. Even clinical pharmacy was 